The same phenomenon, roughly about the same time, around 4,000 calibrated BC, um, at the western fringe of this megaside world, uh, the Michelsberg culture, and I will not be focusing on the French evidence, uh, but on the Western Central European evidence. It's an outcome of a project we've had together for several years, the Michelsberg project, uh, which we're by now finalizing its final publication, I believe. Uh, it's also my fault that it hasn't come up. All right, this is, uh, for those who don't know, uh, this is uh, Michelsberg, is... Um, the period of 4,300, 4,400 to 3,500 calibrated BC. It's the blue bubble there uh, in, um, in France and, um, and Germany. The map is slightly outdated, but it's still okay for this, for this purpose. We think, or many people think, not all, but many people think that Michelsberg emerged uh, somewhere in the Paris Basin, maybe with early outliers in the Neuwied Basin, one incident or one archaeological site is the site of Kobon Gondorf uh, in uh, Neuwied on the Rhine River, which, ha which has also a surprisingly early date. And I'm being told that the pottery there is like the early uh, pottery from the Paris Basin uh, region. So um, the the exact points of origins are still under debate, but it is uh, by and large uh, 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 a French or a Western European phenomenon because many influences in Michelsberg come from southern France. Interestingly, at the very early periods, we also have indications, burial indications, from France only of elite burials like those from the Bourrieux and Valley and other than that, the uh, evidence for burials or elites um, is unfortunately, uh, is unfortunately um, very dim, but we do have an increasing number of burials. I'll be speaking about the burial aspect tomorrow in another session today. I'll restrict myself uh, on the aspect of the settlement system. This is the settlement system as uh, I th have uh, sketched it out so far. We have a central area which is highlighted right there in the Rhine Main area. So presumably people moved from the west into the Rhine Main area in a process that we don't yet really understand fully. We see in many areas that there is a hiatus between the later Middle Neolithic and Michelsberg. So presumably the area was empty for maybe 100 or 200 years, a bit uncertain. And then uh, all of a sudden we see Michelsberg sites appear. Very small Michelsberg sites, not many really, just a few dots here and there, uh, and very small sites too. Um, so that is the full evidence that we have when we plot the entire time uh, slides uh, together. We have a cluster of large sites like Omitz, I'll be talking about it soon, Schierstein and Kapellenberg, all in this, uh, in this area uh, along the Rhine. And then we have an outlier of those large sites here, presumably uh, at the site of Soest in Westphalia, but it's a, it's a site that is fully covered now by the modern or medieval town of Soest, uh, so we don't really know its extensions. But the, the biggest sites here with Olmitz, Schierstein, uh, Kapellenberg, and, and, um, and Glauberg are right here in the Rhine Main area. And you can see if you, if you plot the Michelsberg um, economic system or the long distance trade system as we conceptualize it, conceptualize it very vaguely though, you can see that, this, uh, that the Rhine Main area might have served sort of as a hub between the Western French regions and the regions where people got sold from. And there's good evidence that Michelsberg was, uh, that, that one commodity that was of importance in the Michelsberg long distance economy was really salt. And uh, they might have geared towards the salt sources uh, in Eastern Central Europe uh, today, Halle. Uh, and if you plot, which has been done by colleagues from France, if you plot the so salt sources together with the jade axis, you can see they sort of overlap. Nowhere is there one archaeological site where you can find those two aspects together. But it's just on this grand scale that you see, OK, we have those, uh, those deposits, or the de depots of, of, uh, of jade axis somewhere near salt sources. And all this might be linked to a long distance trade net, a trade net which follows and that had, had 
had been said before, which uh, which is which is using or, or or which started long distance roads, which uh, which are still in use today. So the, many of the German autobahns uh, follow those routes. So this is, for instance, A3 right here, uh, which uh, which uh, which, uh, uh, which were probably being started in uh, in Michelsberg. And the link between Michelsberg site and long distance overland roads has been said before. So it's nothing that uh, I or we invented in our group. And this is another cluster that shows the dimensions. We have sites, nothing uh, above uh, above 100 hectares. So the, they're, they're minute compared to the, uh, to the Tripilia sites, but it's the biggest that we have. You know, Umitz right here, which, uh, which, which is slightly above 100 hectare in size. And this is the site of Urmitz right here. Um, it's been excavated before Second World War, um, fortunately, because after Second World War, the uh, volcanic ash layer uh, there was completely taken away um, so that the entire, uh, the entire soil now is four meters below what it was during the Holocene uh, to rebuild bombed Germany. So we don't have any evidence of the site right now anymore. The site is completely gone. So all we have to look at are, is the uh, excavation evidence from the, be between, largely between uh, the First and the Second World War. And you see people there concentrated really on the ditch system right here. It's a two ditch system and we have evidence of five houses in between, but very little of the interior was excavated nor surveyed. So we really don't know what is inside. This is entire conjecture. That's why I put the, the artist put the fog right here. We don't really what it looked like uh, in the interior, but we know that the, ditch, that the ditches were of enormous size. And we also know that the palisades were of enormous size. The moat length is three kilometers, interior size is 100 hectares. Um, Zimmermann calculated about 10,000 people, if you think of a dense occupied space. Uh, I agree with this. Um, um, we can come up with 14,000, but we only have, actually, we only have five house features documented. So it's all really conjectured. This is the, um, the palisade right here. You see the excavators uh, in there. So it was, it, it was really massive, massive structures, which remind me uh, of the Mississippian structures uh, in uh, in North America, where you have similar uh, posts uh, around the site of Cahokia. Not that I'm suggesting that um, that Umitz was like Cahokia, but there are certain similarities uh, in the site structure. But um, that's about it. You know, we can't say more than structurally it looks like a, a large uh, farming society um, uh, agglomeration site. So um, let's go to Schierstein. Uh, again, we know nothing anymore. Uh, again, an excavation between the wars. Uh, right? No, no, even earlier, before World War I, uh, the, the, uh, a layman excavated this ditch system right here, two ditches again, and it sort of follows on the outskirts of this medieval fishing village, which is now completely overbuilt. Um, we think we can reconstruct the site to this sort of D shape right here, but you see nowadays uh, you can't find any evidence of the site anymore. State heritage has looked, there's no evidence. So all we have are these early excavations. There's a Michelsberg 3 4, uh, three, four uh, uh, pottery assemblage, and we're now running C14 dates from the little uh, bone evidence uh, that we have. So a, a site of possibly enormous dimensions, we don't know anything about the moat length, but possibly 100 hectares again. Uh, again, calculated inhabitants, if you think of a dense occupation space, uh, above 1,000, but here in this case, zero house features documented. Another site, um, Glaubert, underneath the Iron Age site and underneath the medieval site, with a Neolithic occupation layer underneath, the Neolithic site was bigger than any other site thereafter. Wall mode length uncertain, possibly 25 hectares, so minute compared to Tripolia. Uh, calculated inhabitants about 7,000, again, if it was densely occupied like the Tripolia sites, but again, zero house features documented but continues later. We really, you know, we, we envy you for, for this data because we have the phenomenon, 
but we don't really know what to do with it. Only one site, the site that we're working on for about nine years now, is Kapellenberg in the Rhine-Main area, right here, an outlier from the Taunus Hills. You can see the extension of the site right here. It's uh, three kilometers moat length, right here between Wiesbaden and Frankfurt. Main River here, Schierstein is right here, so it's very close between, or midway sort of between Schierstein and Glauberg, a Neolithic site which has the entire wall and moat system preserved three-dimensionally. It's still there because the site was never plowed over or never built over. So this is our latest reconstruction, wall length three kilometers, maximum extension 1300 meters north-south, east-west 500 meters, encompassed space in the outer moat, uh, 45 hectares, so slightly bigger, but the actual settled space is only 24 hectares. So here at first we have the evidence that the outer moat is not the space that was completely settled. It's uh, half of it, really. How do we know it? Because the site has been surveyed by a gentleman who has unfortunately died some years ago for 30 years and he picked up in the deeply forested uh, territory, he picked up each shirt and we can now plop this shirt. You can see all, all those little dots represent a shirt or a, a lithic artifact and you can see it's really, it, it, it res it's restricted to the ridge whereas the outer mode is right here. So you have an, a, 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 a covered settled space on the ridge but the outer fringes were not settled with houses. Two minutes, oh goodness. Um, we um, we cored the entire site uh, and we found out that still, although the site is well preserved, the entire, uh, the entire um, hill ridge is turned over, so we have sedimentary loss there as well. We don't have any house remains either, but we have, uh, we have pits and we have parts of house foundations, but unfortunately we can't come up with any pictures like uh, we've just been shown, but we, we, we excavated <coughs> even within those regions and we found uh, a, a layer of pottery and uh, some pit features there. And uh, what we've did with this data here again, uh, some foundation structures, pottery here. So we do have an in situ layer, but about, about 30 centimeters from the top layers are now missing. And we think that the site became already decomposed at the time when the people settled there. So this is our calculation for Kapellenberg. If we compare it with uh, Lakeshore sites and their uh, the, the density of houses there, we, uh, we come up to the conclusion that the density of house sites from the pottery remains that we have um, would have been only about, well, about a few, about a few years. Well, this is still in German, I'm sorry. Um, it would have been just a few years. So the, the, our first calculation was 7,200 uh, inhabitants. But if we use comparative uh, comparison data from the Lakeshore settlements, we come up to a much lesser number, 700 to 900 inhabitants um, for about seven years of duration. We know pottery is missing, but still this is the lowest number that we can up with. So just about not more than 1,000 people lived at this site for currently, we think, about seven uh, at the lowest number at seven, seven years. However, the, um, the uh, C14 data that we have sh uh, show that the site was inhabited for about 200 years. So we have to fit this period of seven years plus within those 200 years somehow. And this is the model that we use it right now. At the moment, we have an an erection of the first wall system around 4,100 to 4,000, no evidence of inside occupation, a reconstruction of the, of the wall, of, of, the, of, the, of the mode and ditch system, again, no evidence for, for inside occupation, then a restructuring, a refortification of the defense system, then we have for 200 years evidence for interior occupation, and then a final phase where a most massive wall was built. But for this period, again, we don't have any inside occupation from the little data that we have. So a very volatile, very fl fluctuative system, which we have to somehow 
fit into a settlement system that we don't really understand, but which we think uh, circles around those keywords. Uh, that's why I use those keywords, because we don't have really much to say, but just giving glimpses and aspects of what the Michelsberg system consisted of. We have this concentration of huge sites of probably short-term occupation, interior occupation, but which were built for almost 800, or is stood there uh, in, in the landscape for almost 800 years. And those sites sort of composed an inner core settlement system from which the Michelsberg culture radiated out to its periphery with uh, compositions of slavery, violence, and aggression involved. I'll be talking about this tomorrow. Uh, and uh, all this was somehow tied together by a long distance, um, a long distance trade system which circled around bringing jade axes in and possibly taking salt out to the more western regions. These are the dynamics, our site numbers, and we see that uh, the sites were inhabited towards the peak and towards the end of the curve system. And so a pattern which is roughly similar to what we see in the LBK system. And this is uh, probably has to do with the end of it. We have a draw period very much at the end of the Michelsberg culture, but this is of unimportance right here. Now, I thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.